Together in the first read series, where I read a poem by a poet I don't know or know very little about, and just read a poem for the sheer joy of it. I will sometimes change my mind about the poem when I go back and learn more about that poet's aesthetics or their tradition or anything like that. But, you know, I got into poetry by just enjoying it at the first read, so I can do this. It's not meant to teach you, and maybe it won't be any good at all. This is from Amber Flora, amberflora.com. A nice little journal has fairly international uh, spin to it, so it's nice to look at. This is by Petra Kamala, Ways to Enter Deep Waters. I kind of pick these pieces randomly. I just kind of flip through sometimes. And I, this one I spotted because it is a list poem, and I love list poems. I don't know why. I've always loved list poems. Maybe this has to do with like the my early love of like loving the list of Homer, which I know will turn a lot of people off. Or just writing list poems myself uh, years ago. But I always liked them. Um, so I'm just going to go into it. So I look at this one, and if I expand or shrink the page, the the lines will change. So this, I'm assuming, is just a prose poem. It's in an open form, and it's written in a list format. I don't see much else going off of traditional form beyond that. So I'm just going to go there. Ways to enter deep water. The list with the numbers, you know, it looks like there's going to be many ways to enter deep water, which is, I think, is kind of an interesting concept of like to start off like entering deep water like you'd need a list of ways to do that but we start off with this pack everything you need in the roll top exclusion bags tightly looped three times over so this first line i'm not sure what to make of it and we have a speaker telling us it looks like what to do or telling somebody what to do which i'm guessing is to enter into deep water but it's to pack everything you need into these bags and tightly loop them three times over. This is a weird concept to enter deep water, to pack everything you need in it, <coughs> in a bag, and take it with you. Are you going to float with the bag? Um, what is going to be done with it? We're not sure. We're not told. Number two, see there? But I'm not sure what I see there. Do I see that I'm supposed to have this bag? The unsettled amber ribs of water laddering out beyond behind the breakers. The rip will lead you to the back out to sea. So like if you're telling you to look, it's, it's almost as if the person is pointing there. See there, the speaker is pointing. Do you see the ribs pointing? I didn't much sure the amber ribs of water, why, why the water is amber here. But the amber ribs laddering out behind the breakers, which you can kind of see that image pretty clearly if water is laddering out, leading you to deep water, like a way to find yourself in. The zip will lead you to the back, out to the sea. There's a very nice sound to these lines, very poetic sound. Um, a lot of like alliteration here, kind of internal rhyme behind the breakers, um, back out to sea. Very nice kind of sound to this. Look at the you know, mix of, uh, it's not a traditional piece, but there's a nice play of the, the meter of the lines themselves. Swim with me until your breath gives expires and the moon has risen over the bay this is, is an interesting line like swim until your breath gives expires like you know we think of your breath expiring it's not usually a good thing like swim with you like this brings up the question of the speaker here should we be trusting the speaker to take us into deep water is this a trustworthy person we're going into deep water with or is there something else going on are we going to drown in the water with them that they lead us into I'm not really sure and you know swim out and the moon has risen over the bed and that like brings a a pretty dark image like i mean the moon over the water is great but if you're swimming out in the darkness in the moon over water that's that's a, that's a little bit of a different image there before hold your breath the buoys will keep the bags afloat above us. So are these the bags in the first stanza of the first line? Um, I'm not sure. Are these the bags that were tightly tied up? Spear downward, feet first, then flip your entire body. No, trust me. Which is an interesting image because in the last line, I think we had the trust question of do I trust this person who's leading me into deep water and now this person is saying trust me which makes me as a reader trust the person even less 
I mean, there's this kind of narrative that seems to be happening, ways to go out into the deep water. Like you, you see it first, you pack up, you swim out, you spear downward. It's like there's a narrative, but it's not a clear narrative um, in this. Number five, trust me that the body remembers the weightlessness of fluid extending on every side. Such universal hold, which is really kind of a beautiful line, which does make me want to trust the, the, the speaker a little bit more, this sense of weightlessness that brings up so many images from like just floating on the water to like floating in the womb to the sense that our body will just remember what to do. Such universal hold. Number six, Halcyon swam for her love as a kingfisher piercing the water over and over again and threading it with her loss. So we go from a universal hold, and then we get this kind of you know ancient image. This is a Greek image, but even older than the Greeks. It's an old, very old image. Halcyon is where we get the, the term Halcyon. Halcyon um, swam for her love. You know, I, my, the story is sketchy. So just stick with my memory. It's my story, my memory has Alcyon. Um, she and her husband offended Zeus, I think. They called each other like by Zeus and uh, Zeus and Juno's names. So that created uh, this punishment of them, this irritation. You know, Zeus is always getting mad at everybody. Um, and she swims out to sea, and I think they like end up drowning or something. Um, I'm not sure what it is, but I remember there's there's a connection between her and a kingfisher in this story. So that seems to be being played on here. Like she swims out with her love, swimming for her love. Like in the story, I think he swims out too. So it's kind of universal theme of swimming out with your love piercing the water over and over again and threading it with her loss, or like the loss of her love. She's swimming out with this, which is, you know, an interesting image to bring here with we're having a speaker at, like bringing us out into deep water, asking us to trust and then saying this, here's an image of this person swimming out with her loss, which doesn't inspire confidence in being led by somebody. The oxygen tanks will help and I will strap weights. I'm going to dive knife to your help. So it's not like some person's going to help you get to the bottom. Avalon fishermen stick to the rocks and count harp beaks of incoming swell. This image of what people do to get deep. Number nine, in deep ocean waves rotate in circular motion. And you will sense you are being carried, not forward, but up and down. The sense that once you're down under... You'll be moved. Your body kind of gets moved in itself by the rotation of the water. Ten, grief as a kingfisher. This is the kingfisher from above. We have this tied to the image of the two lovers who are lost to each other because of, I don't know, whatever it is, is their desire to have their love be as significant as the God's love um, is dulled and other things take flight in the mind of a bird. Oops. Sorry. So she became as interested in the sky as she is in her love, and the dreams of her love become bright blue feathers on the tide. That's such a beautiful like line right there. Become bright blue feathers on the tide. This bright blue feathers. So these three stresses in a row. You have the alliteration of the bees, and then you have the unstress, unstress, stress with tie on the tide, which just creates a nice sound there. So grief as a kingfisher is dulled and other things take flight in the mind of a bird. These things are like in the mind of a bird, which connect to this Greek story. So she becomes interested in the sky as she is. So it's like she's looking at this image with bird and her love become these bright food feathers on the tide. She's like floating in this. It's definitely playing off this, this myth. I think it would help if I remember the myth a little bit more closely. Um, but clearly there's a sense of this this woman floating in the water, becoming part of the water with her love. I'm not saying you should trust me because all people wade into shallow water sometimes. 
an interesting line there. It's like, I'm not saying you should trust me, but earlier the speaker has twice said, trust me. So this is almost as if the speaker can't decide whether he, she, him, they, they, whatever it is, is trustworthy in this situation. So it's hard to know what to do with that. Number 12, most of the things that will kill you can be found on land with them. That's definitely true. Well, as if to save yourself, you should go into deep water with this speaker, should dive in. And I feel like this poem kind of works like that. It's pulling us in to these significant thoughts. We're not sure what to do with them quite. It's like we're pulled into language and left in language that way. 13. And then the form changes here into something that looks more like a traditional poem in itself in this last stanza. Deep water closes to remember its language. Deep water opens to remember it's alive. Deep water dreams and we must enter. It is very much that what I just said in that last allowing the sense of going into myth, going into some kind of like um, thing the body remembers and just being kind of swallowed up by the language of it. Not necessarily knowing what to do with it, kind of remembering it, being in it, and like not knowing whether to trust or not trust it, but just being willing to float and exist in it. I don't know if that's doing justice to this poem, that, that quick reading of it. There's a lot of stuff going on in this one. Um, actually, it's making me very interested in Petra Kamula's work. Um, I'd like to see more of what this is going on. It doesn't feel like a traditional list poem at all, which is no big thing. I said I love list poems, but that doesn't as an effect this at all. It's it's its own thing, um, and it, it's like the numbers or steps going towards something, not, but not completely. They're not like a a list that you have to follow or something. Very interesting. I'd like to learn more about this person. Uh, there's a little note: Australian British. Poet essayists, oh, interested in alternative, subversive myth, history, geographies. It kind of makes sense from what uh, um, I just read here. So uh, I think that's kind of an interesting way of thinking of this uh, of this piece. Anyway, as I said, Amber Flora, Petra Kamala.